Good morning, friends. It is seed start and Saturday, and it is your friend Lisa Mason Ziegler. And I'm a little frazzled because I've been outside gardening, y'all, till the very last minute or farming, actually. So I am um, got a lot of stuff lined up for our show today, um, including Happy Earth Day, y'all. Um, I know that Jesse shared with me a document. So Jessie, who y'all have been, she's the Gardener's Workshop in the comments here, is the producer of our show. And she's just helping me really kind of remember to say the things that I want to say to you guys. Um, and so I had totally blocked out Earth Day. So thank you, Jessie, and happy Earth Day to everybody. And of course, there is nothing more earth friendly than buying local. And that includes local flowers. And friends, I will tell you that this past week, um, y'all know that I'm in the middle of a photo shoot for um, the newest book. And y'all see all these flowers behind me? That is a third of what I see over here. It's unbelievable. Anyway, there's one particular flower that I was afraid wasn't going to bloom for me before my deadline. So I actually made a purchase from a co-op and in the Richmond area ordered some flowers um, locally grown. And I just can't wait to get them. I just love supporting them and being a part of that. And I don't know that I'll need to use them because I actually cut some of what I bought today, but doesn't matter. Um, so local flowers and there's just nothing even friendlier than um, local organic flowers. You know, um, we get a lot of questions about that. And no, we don't use pesticides and those types of things, not even organics, because really, y'all, it's all about technique. And the way you live with your garden is what really helps you to restore the natural order, right? And so Jessie shared, and I'm so glad she did. Um, if you want to know more about the bigger flower um, industry, like globally, what happened? How did it go from being 80% grown in the United States to now 20% or less is grown in the United States? The rest of it is shipped in from distant lands. The book, and I read this book a long time ago, it's called Flower Confidential by Amy Stewart. And um, it is a great read. And in fact, it's been so long that I just may actually, once my deadlines are passed, y'all, I may actually reread it again because it follows flowers from where they are grown and through the system. And it's just very, very eye opening. If you're a flower farmer, you've got to read it because it builds your level of expertise, right? Um, and then I also want to say that my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, is all about how I farm and garden sustainably without pesticides and minimal herb um, fertilizers. So my book and Jesse will put the links in there um, to those. And so you can find them afterwards. And, you know, if you want to watch the replay in YouTube, they're not in with the rest of the videos. I think there's actually a little tab that says live and you can find all the lives there if you'd like to. And then last, um, we have two courses that are really about the local flower scene. Well, they're all about local flowers, right? But kind of target, and that is the no-till micro scale flower farm with Jonathan and Megan Lease. They farm on less than a half an acre and, um, they only sell flowers in the spring and early summer, y'all. And their method, their model for business is just so incredible. Um, and so that's a great one to think about. And then also, of course, Ellen Frost's course about growing your business with local sourcing. And if you're a flower farmer, friends, you want your customers to connect with Ellen. She teaches them why and how to grow, to buy local and how they market them. And anyway enough said, right? But we have a ton of those types of resources over at thegardenersworkshop.com. So today I am going to do our sunflowers, but I'm going to do that last because you want to know what's really become apparent to me <laughs> after how many years is this? This is my 25th year flower farming, but doing this with you guys like this started through the pandemic, right? This was my weekly gab with somebody besides myself and my dog, right? But, you know, I have learned that these jobs that I do on camera with you guys is keeping me accountable. I hope maybe it's doing it for you, too, that you can sow your sunflowers or do whatever you need to do um, that you might otherwise push aside until 
hey, and Chris is doing it. So and my son's with you. So I almost didn't do this. So I'll tell you. So I've got a little deadline for it's called an art log. The art log is where the images for a book project are logged and everybody has access to it. Your photographer, me, the editor, the art director at the book. I mean, there's a lot of people that look at this art log and it's like an Excel sheet and I am not a good Excel sheet person. Anyway, um, I have a new little deadline to get that like as completed as possible for everybody. And I was supposed to do that this morning, but I ended up walking Tucker around the yard, around the farm and decided that I was going to net do some whole weeding and I actually cut a few flowers because we have a big rainstorm, which we really need this afternoon. So I almost didn't prepare for this show like I ended up doing it because y'all, I have all these tomato transplants that need to be bumped up. Bobo is too busy. We are so deep in cutting flowers now, planting flowers and maintaining our beds that she doesn't have time to do this. So it was like me or nobody. So because of you guys, we will have tomatoes this year and my neighbors will have tomato plants. I don't sell them. And so I thought I would start it off by showing you what we did last week. We did them last week, right? This is the tray that we bumped up last week. Let's see what the roots are looking like. They're just starting to come through. So these are the Cherokee purples and they'll grow probably like two more weeks, which will be the perfect. Our nighttime temperatures, if you look at the two week forecast here, are still in the 50s at night. And yes, they'd survive, but they wouldn't be happy. And so why plant them? And so we're not. Um, so these will continue to grow. And then today we are going to pot up the rest of my other varieties of tomatoes, as well as some peppers. But here's what I wanted to say. And this is, you can look forward till next week. Um, and I don't know if um, I hadn't shared this with Jesse because it's just kind of developed this morning. As I was making all these two inch blocks to bump up my tomatoes and my peppers, I realized, oh my gosh, I need to share with you guys our new commercial um, soul blockers, the Swift blockers. We have those. And so the Swift blocker, which I'm going to be doing that next Saturday, you can go to our website anytime and watch the videos of me doing it on there and talking about what's great about them. But the really wonderful thing I realized this morning, I will not be bumping up tomatoes and peppers anymore because I'm going to be starting my tomatoes and peppers in the mini 75 Swift blocker because it's bigger than the small block but not as big as the two inch block. So it like the peppers and the tomatoes can be started in that and grown completely through. And I think I've shown you in past shows, um, we started our ornamental peppers, the rooster peppers, which are by the way now available on our website and um, the app while supplies last. Those are the cut flower peppers that are awesome, right? And um, so that's what I started. Up. I started them in that block, the mini 75. That means there's 75 blocks that are made in one push y'all. It is such a great come alongside my lad Brooks because frankly, so I would never, this is 60 big beefs. These would have been started. I would have started 75 of them in the big block and they would have in the, the mini 75 and they wouldn't have had to be bumped up, but I am still going to be doing bumping probably on peppers because I don't need 75 of them, right? Um, so they're coming alongside. And so next Saturday, that is my plan to demonstrate the Swift blockers and show you how I'm using them and how they're kind of fitting in to my commercial operation. And we're just thrilled. They're made here in the United States. They're made in Michigan um, by a small family business. And we're kind of thrilled. We're kind of stoked about it. So out of the gate this morning, I am going to be potting up, bumping up some tomato plants. Um, I did want to show you, like, for instance, I'd still be doing this with my Ladbrook blocker. This is the two inch blocker. Look, this one is literally just being born right there. Um, these are cucumbers and we started them in this and they'll just grow on because I don't need 75 of them or even 27, which is the other size. Um, so I see that this these new commercial blockers are really allowing me to streamline and be more efficient, but to use them where I need to. It's not changing everything I'm doing. It is just helping with the big overall picture. 
So first thing we have to do is, you know, I always use mask and tape and our garden marker. The garden marker is actually made. What are these big beefs? Um, garden markers are made to withstand UV rays. So these tomatoes were started March 27th. They should have probably been like this. We should have done this last week when we did those others, right? Um, and use a mask and tape in this, and it does not wash off. It does not just disappear one day, which is exactly what happens when you use pens made for indoor use like Sharpies, right? So I have to do that. So I did not water these this morning because I wanted to be able to just pick them up. I'm literally picking up the whole cluster, <laughs> trying to do it without destroying them, y'all. So there's a whole cluster of 20. And I'll tell you, when I'm planting zinnias out in the garden, this is literally where um, I, how I do the zinnias. Sorry, y'all. I have to like block the comments because I try to read them and it totally distracts me. Um, I would pick up a whole handful and just break them off. And I am going, I'm going to put the camera down so y'all can see what I'm doing. Some of these roots are going to be danglers. You know, there's going to be some of them sticking out. But you know what I figured out? It's just really not, you don't really need to stop and take a lot of time doing stuff. Um, and you know what I wanted to say was I, I kind of speed made all these blocks. I mean, I made, this is um, 30 50, 70, 90, 110, 130. I made 130 of these two inch blocks in probably like 15 minutes. So they're not the most, they're not the most perfect blocks I've ever made, but you want to know what my theory is? It's better than no blocks at all if I had not made them. And then these block, these tomatoes just wouldn't have been potted up. So I'm pulling them apart and literally just dropping them in the hole. And this allows me to grow them on. Can y'all see? I'm literally just pulling them apart and then just tucking all those roots in. And while there are some sticking out the top, tomatoes are vigorous enough that they will just move on and they're going to regrow. I will pull off some of the really long ones. This one is literally crumbling in my hand. I think probably if I would have watered these it might have done a little better. Um, so I am just breaking them off. See that long one? I'm just going to break that off. And then I'm just dropping it right down into a hole. So in a perfect world, these would have this would have happened to these probably when they're 10 days old. You know, you don't need them to be big. You just need them to be well rooted in and they'll just continue the growth cycle you know and i'm sure somebody's going to ask well why wouldn't you just start them in the big block because you run into the same problems that we experience that most people experience trying to start little seeds in large i skipped right over this one in large um chunks of soil it's just difficult to keep that mass of soil evenly warm and moist. The small block just makes it super easy and is the most efficient use of the real estate on your um, heat mat and your grow light because we are, this week we're planting tons of stuff. There's literally, these will stay in for the grow lights um, for this for the next few days because our carport is so full of seedlings that are hardening off. I mean, there's like probably eight, 9,000 seedlings out there. Um, so I'm just continuing to break them apart and bump them up. And I'm not going to do all of them here for us today. But I am going to do some of the peppers. So we grow peppers for eating as well as um, those ornamental, we have a seed grower that grows the seeds for our rooster peppers. And let's get another chunk. So you can see that this is, this is what I'm pulling from. Look at the mat on the bottom, which, you know, that just tells you how happy they are. 
but it's just more pulling apart. So in a perfect world, you would do this when they're 10 days old and it wouldn't be quite so intense of so many roots to deal with. Just slows you down. Y'all, I mean, for me, I was when I was walking the dog this morning, I was thinking to myself that I attribute so much of my success in business and as a flower farmer is that I am pretty crazy about trying to plant stuff on the right timing, which means they grow effortlessly. I'm not trying to cuddle them and help them along, right? Um, that makes a really huge difference. And what made me think of this is I am really struggling right now with, um, you know, our focus for our flowers has changed in the last two years. It's gone from being a high production urban farmer to an educator, which means our gardens and our flowers are more for imaging and, you know, making videos and courses and books and all such things, right? Well, that means that you have to leave the flowers in the garden longer, past when they should be cut, because it's better for photography. I mean, and you just don't know what a struggle it is for me. I have to like walk away the peonies on my farm right now are busting loose. We harvest those as flower farmers. Turn this so you can still see me. We harvest those. Um, we're almost done with these, y'all. We harvest them in bud, which I will get some of them in bud so we can take photography indoors showing what they should look like, right? But in general... Nobody for the, the gorgeous pictures that we need for different applications need lots of flowers. And it's just a struggle for me. Y'all, I have roots and dirt. Can y'all see that all over my computer? All right. So that quick, we bumped up all of these. So these are big beefs. This is my go-to tomato. We'll plant these again. Uh, we'll start them again in July. Wish I had somewhere to put these over here. Ooh, perfect. All right, so I wanna do one more tray, a smaller tray um, of the peppers. Which peppers are these? We, I wanna do the jalapenos. The jalapenos, those are Stevie's favorites. And um, so I'm doing these, I'm just doing, um, 16 of these. That's all the blocks that'll fit. These are our green trays that we love so very much. So I started 20 of these um, peppers, but not every one of them germinated. So first out, we got to use our, do our name tag, right? And then we're going to get to our sunflowers. And you know, the other things that um, for local flowers, if you're a flower farmer, um, the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers and y'all can't find the end. There it is. Um, Slow Flowers and the Association of Specialty Cut Flowers. And what are these called? These are Jedi. These are our seeds that we, the line of seeds that we actually sell, y'all. You can find them. I can never spell jalapeno. And these were started March 30th. Um, anyway, if you're a flower farmer, you need to be a part of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. It's an educational organization. You just can't imagine. Um, it's 200 bucks a year, and you'll make that back in a nanosecond from what you learn from the private talks boards, all the recorded conferences, how to market your flowers, um, all of that stuff. All right, so these are my jalapenos because we don't need many. I certainly don't need 20, um, but we started 20 because I'll share these with some of our friends. Um, and I'm just going to pick this whole cluster up. Let's get rid of him. And then I'm just going to, these aren't quite as vigorous as tomatoes are. So there you go. So let me move you down so you can see what I'm doing. So I am literally just going to drop them into the hole. So the two inch blocker that I'm potting into um, had the insert Sorry, y'all, I'm picking um, seeds off. Had the insert um, attachment installed on them. 
so that it makes the perfect hole in the top of the two inch um, so that these guys just literally drop right in. And this is it, y'all. There is no additional anything that I do to these after um, I get off here. These will be put back under the grow lights until we make room out on the carport. It's still a little cool at night to leave these outside. And some of these just have the seeds still attached. And I'm just obviously picking the best transplants since I would have four too many if they had all germinated. And pepper plants are pretty hardy. Um, they're pretty easy to grow if you give them heat and full sun. They're pretty pest free also and very abundant. Um, and Steve loves jalapeno peppers. He loves to pick them when he's mowing. When he drives by, he'll stop and just snag some off, particularly when they're really little. They aren't quite so hot then. So I'm just dropping them in, tucking in as many as possible. And I think I am going to have to use some of these that are still in the process. Let me get rid of that seed. So sometimes the seeds just hold on. You just pinch them off and they'll continue to develop. We call them on Snapdragon's helmet heads. When they hold on to their seed, that's lack of moisture during their sprouting process. We have three, four holes left. Let's put that one there. We'll do this one. And I did an experiment this morning, y'all. I pinched half of my Campanula and didn't pinch the other half. I can't wait to see how that goes. And there's the last one. And there you go. So there is a tray of peppers that will grow on probably for two to three, maybe two weeks um, to let them just get well established. And then they will go out into Steve's garden where he can drive by and nab them. So let's talk about sunflowers. We're doing our weekly sunflowers here. All right. y'all. I pounded so many steaks this morning. It was so good. Um, and I need to replenish my steaks is what's really becoming obvious me to me this morning when I was out there doing it. And um, so cool flowers, because we got that, I guess it was three or four weeks like in early March, all of a sudden it was spring in Virginia. I mean, we were up at 60 and 70 degrees. Um, my snaps got away from me. They did not get, um, they did not get netted, which is what I wanted to talk to you about while I'm doing my sunflowers today. Um, and so my snaps aren't netted, um, but a lot of the other stuff is just coming on. And so that's what I was doing here this morning. What is today? 422. So today I'm starting peach again, gold light. Yesterday on the um, shopping show inside our app, I gave away six of my favorite sunflowers. That's what made me bring peach back out because peach really is, when I was looking at the picture, it really is one of my favorites. It's really beautiful. And bouquet mix. So again, I use mask and tape. Um, and our pen to mark. I mean, the most important piece of information is the date, because when you start planting sunflowers every single week, it's amazing how two weeks that are a week apart can look so similar and you get confused over which one should be planted next. Because the goal is, as we start a tray a week, we plant a tray a week. Um, and then in turn, then once they start, you are cutting a tray a week, right? So what I wanted to say about netting, um, I see so much improper netting done online. And when netting is installed incorrectly, it is a death trap for wildlife and for people because it's so easy to get caught in it. But when you, and you can go to our website, I think there's a video actually on the um, product page. Um, that netting 
should never have excess netting hanging off the edge. I see people letting the extra blocks hang off the edge that aren't in a stake. That has to be cut off. You cannot leave that there. You, you only have to have an employee break a leg once and you would learn why you would never do that. But for me, more importantly, it's about wildlife. When wildlife, if they were to walk into the netting when it's nice and taut, they can pull their leg back out. But when it's loose, they cannot do that. Not to mention it doesn't work on flowers when it's loose either. Um, so this morning when I was, I am the only person that installs net on this farm. I will not, I mean, it's, it seems to be a real learning curve for people. It's one of the things I do show in flower farming school. Um, and doing it this morning, which is why my back hurts, I was pounding way too many. I pounded more stakes this morning than I like to um, at one time, but I had to get a lot done. So back to sunflowers. So plant support netting, she just put the link on here. You can go over there and check it out. Um, but you go to one, you go to the one end, you install the stakes, taunt side to side. Then you go all the way to the other end pull it as tight as you can, not super tight, but taunt and install it. Then you do one side and then you do the other side. You do not do this. Side. Oh, I mean, I've just seen a lot of improper ways and it is just so, and then people complain they can't harvest through it. Well, of course they can't because it's not installed properly. I harvest through netting just as quickly as I do without netting y'all. It's just about anyway, how it has to be done. So I'm just looking for something to put this um here i gotta raise my tray so y'all can see me better so we'll plant our sunflowers so why are we planting sunflowers every week because sunflowers are a cash cow for flower farmers if you plant them every week if you grow them small meaning a three to four inch size bloom because you control the spacing with um, how you, you control the bloom size with the spacing. This tray is a 128 plug tray. It is full of 50% of any potting mix without chemicals and 50% finished compost. We buy it bagged. We mix a big bale of pro mix with um, a big bag of compost, mix it up in a big tub and just have it so I can just fill up my trays as needed. I am just dropping one sunflower seed on the surface of every cell and sunflowers sprout best when they're covered. They need darkness and it also helps them to shed their hull when they snap open. And um, so I'm just putting one and that is, we'll do more of the peach. We haven't started peach in a while, have we? So back in our high production years, um, I started 10 trays a week. That's 1,200 sunflowers a week, um, which floated our bouquet business as well as we sold hundreds. What is next? Gold light. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sunflowers each week to our commercial customers. Um, so sunflowers, it's like I think it's too simple for some people. They think it needs to be harder to be able to make a profit. Literally, I'm serious about that. They think they need to invest a lot of money in a crop. Um, and you can do that too. I'm just saying most people overlook the potential of sunflowers. And it's about growing them the right size and the right varieties. Um, we grow pro cuts because the one I, I only grew one sunflowers when we sunflower in color when I was in high production. And that was pro cut orange. Sold 1,200 of those a week, week after week for 26 weeks, y'all. Um, it is the standard recognized sunflower. And we sold it over, and, I mean, for years. That wasn't a fluke. We did it over and over again. Um, and now, because of what I do for education, and as we move from high production to um just supplying our members only market, we started becoming more diverse in what we grew. And that's why we started mixing the colors up. But these are all pro cuts. So they follow the same timeline. So here it is. If you start sunflowers every week 
at least one of the sunflowers that you start is the same color and variety every single week so that your timing stays on. And that in turn should mean that you'll have sunflowers to cut every week once they get to their end of um, 55 to 60 days is what it takes for a pro cut. And so that means you'll have sunflowers to cut every week. And, you know, it's just that simple, y'all. And we have been, did that and it like just, I mean, I just can't tell you how it puffs up your standing orders, your bouquets. It makes it all so simple. So now we have um, these sunflowers on the surface. I just take my finger and push them down in here. This covers them. Now, if you looked in these cells right now, you could probably still see the sunflower in most of them. But once I take this into my grow room, use a watering can with a sprinkler head and water this thoroughly, it'll wash the excess soil off the walls of the cells and that will cover the seed. You do not need to do another step of taking this tray back to your soil bin and add more soil on top of it. It's just not necessary. I'll then put this seedling heat mat onto a... Um, I'm sorry, this tray onto a seedling heat mat and wait and probably take about three to five days. And once 50% of these sunflowers start showing their necks, you know, they, that little neck comes up. Once you see that, that's considered sprouted. Once 50% of these do it, I'll take them off of the heat and either put them under grow lights or put them outside in full blast in sun if it's warm enough. If you want them to grow fast and it's still cool at night like it is here for us, you might as well leave them inside if you have grow room space because it's warmer in my grow room and they'll grow faster. It kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? Um, so we grow them until they're two and a half to three weeks old. How I know two to three weeks is what I say to people. Our window is typically two and a half weeks when Bobo goes to pull the stem and the whole cell of soil just comes right out easily without you feeling like you're going to rip the stem from the roots, um, that's when they're ready to plant. And if you are having trouble getting a strong root system, you're not heating them up enough to get them to sprout and grow. That's where the heat mat just really, boom, just makes them start growing right away and have a vigorous root system. We then plant them out into the garden um, with a bed that has been prepared with the dry organic fertilizer, which I talked about that yesterday on the show, y'all. Um, if you want to check that out, if you download, go to your app store, just search Gardener's Workshop, download our free app, and you can watch the replays. You can watch or bring up a video, and at the bottom, it'll say shop all. Hit that. It'll bring up all the products I talk about in that video that's about an hour long, and if you touch that product, it'll jump right to where that product is. Anyway, I talked about the fertilizer yesterday um, and you can find that on our website so you can learn more about it. Um, so 30 inch wide bed because our bed maker makes them. Um, five rows, no film. We do not use Bio 360 for sunflowers. We do not put down irrigation and we do not use netting to support the flowers. But this is what we do. We add the organic fertilizer. We incorporate it. We then plant our transplants, five rows, six inches apart in the row between the plants. Um, and then Bobo hand waters with a wand and a hose. Um, everybody gets an extreme drink. You know what I mean? Like we know every single, sorry, y'all, my nose. It's the soil making my nose itch. Um, we know that um, each plant gets water. And then basically they're left on their own. But we get rain all the time here in Virginia, y'all. We get 52 inches a year. So if you're dry, you might, you're going to need to water or do irrigation. I'm just telling you what I do here. We basically ignore them. We do not net them. Should they be netted? Yes. Here's another thing about netting. Netting is like a seat belt, or you might think about it like car insurance. You know, you probably don't need it most of the time, but when you need it, you need it. You know, I mean, the time that you don't have your seatbelt on when you run to your neighbor's house two blocks away and you have a car accident and you don't have a seatbelt on, I mean, it's devastating. But how easy would it have been to have just put your seatbelt on? That's what netting is to me. And it's like when you need it, you need it. Because when I don't net, 
you have a calculated risk when, when rain comes. And I am willing to take that risk with sunflowers. During those years of planting 1,200 a week for 26 weeks, we could not possibly net all those sunflowers. There was not enough people on this farm. There was too many jobs to do, right? So I decided that was a calculated risk. I was willing to sacrifice some of the stems that we would lose in a downpour and it really works out. And that's the way I look at it now. Sometimes because I'm not a commercial, it depends on how bad you need the crop too. If I was a small grower, I would net everything. You can't afford to lose a 10 foot patch of something if that's all you've got, right? Um, but when you've got a hundred foot, potentially, maybe you wouldn't lose it all. So you have to kind of like do your own equation. You have to be a business person and do triage. That's what I look at and say, all right, if I don't net this, what is the like? That's why our bachelor buttons didn't get netted this year. It's like, I just need some images. And if that means I have to cut them short to show them, that's what I'm willing to do. These are the kind of business decisions you have to make. Instead of me struggling to net the bachelor buttons or the snaps late, which would take me three times longer, I am going to not just do it and take the calculated risk. Um, so we take these sunflowers, they're planted, they're watered in, we leave them. We don't net them. They have no bio 360 and we come back when they're in bud and ready to cut. And we have sunflowers every single week. Um, and that's kind of it, y'all. And so I'm going to take a look at some of your questions here. Jesse has starred some of them for me um, to see what you guys are asking here. So Kathy's patch says, what should I do with the aphids? <laughs> aphids, for anyone that's not familiar, um, aphids are a pest. They're very common in spring crops um, and because they just... Their temperature, temperature regulated just like everything else is, right? Once it reaches, and I don't know what that temperature is, um, they break out and they love fresh, new, tender growth. And so this is the time of the year, right? And those crops that tend to have a lot of fresh, tender growth or the qualities of that tender growth, and I do believe I could be wrong about this, but it has something to do with the sugars, um, they're really attracted to that. And there's some plants that have higher sugars than others. Like, for instance, Asclepius, which I don't grow as a commercial cut flower. Um, common milkweed. I mean, it's you, you don't even try to get rid of it. <laughs> Aphids are OK. I mean, the good bugs come in and eat them. They got to have somebody to eat. Um, but there's a lot of aphids present. And if you don't know what they look like, they can be all different colors. Just do a search and look at the images. Um, but we really depend on our beneficial community coming in and taking care of that. But if they get, if we have an outbreak of aphids, we use what works really, really well. And we've all got it. And it's not a pesticide. It's called water. You know, if you get your hose with a jet control on it, so you can just kind of hold the water and jet and I just rub the stems like this and you're not getting every single one off. You're knocking the numbers down while you're waiting for the beneficial insects to come in. Of course, you have to not be using pesticides in your garden because you're probably killing the good stuff too, right? Um, so that was a great question, Kathy. So that's what I do. We either leave them and allow and wait, wait for, it's not just ladybugs. There are so many soldier beetles. There are so many beneficial insects that eat soft bodied pests like aphids. Um, but teenager, and I will say this, um, y'all, I'm sorry. I get, when I get soil on my hands and touch my face, um, aphids, um, I forgot, what I totally lost my train of thought. Um, but aphids, oh, ladybugs. If you don't know what a juvenile ladybug looks like, it, it does not look anything like an adult ladybug. You, that's your homework. I want to hear next week how many people went and looked that up and were surprised. A juvenile ladybug that looks nothing like it's before they get their shell eats more aphids than an adult ladybug does. But I can promise you 99% of them get squashed or killed and sprayed in gardens because they look like a little crocodile. They look like some bad little bug. So that's your homework. Jesse, help me remember to ask next week who actually looked it up and got a lesson from that because I will tell you when I was doing traveling conferences and talking at programs, I would show a picture of a, of a ladybug baby 
a big screen. I'm talking horticulturists, flower farmers, master gardeners, garden clubs. I would put it up there. And I am telling you that the lion's share of people had no idea what it was. And that is our problem. We don't identify before we actually take action. And so that's your homework for next week. And so I leave them alone or I use water to blast them off. You could do it with a squirt bottle if you don't have a lot, but I drag a hose. All right, so Kathy has another question. Can amaranth be transplanted if nights are in the low 50s? Well, I'm faced with that too. I have 10 tray, I have a thousand transplants of 10 different amaranths to plant. And I'm just kind of holding off. Um, so warm season, again, yes, you can. Probably won't kill them, but it won't help them either. When they get cold at night, it just kind of shuts them down. And they barely get revved up the next day in the heat and it gets cold again the next night. So it's this constant up and down. What does that do? Stress, pest, disease, opening the door. That's rolling out the carpet for pest and disease. So if you don't pinch them, if you need to in the tray, if they're soil blocks, I don't know about doing that in plugs, um, and let them regrow. That'll buy you another week to 10 days. That's what I'm getting ready to do. My amaranth is still in the grow room. We're going to bump that outside as soon as we get a lot of this stuff planted. And I'm going to pinch it so that buys me seven to 10 more days. All right. So I'm in. The... So Kathy has another. Kathy, you have some great questions because Jesse's cherry picking uh, my questions. I need to get a course on marketing with lots of celosia plants and don't know how to price them to florists. With our growing season, um, I have Celosia available till Thanksgiving. So, Kathy, um, we do have a course. Ellen Frost's new course, Preparing to Sell to Florist, has three main targets. Let me see if I can remember them. It is how to create your availability list, how to figure out pricing, and then how to target your customer. And it's 50 bucks. It's on demand, and it's the best fit. I mean, 50 bucks, that's five, that's four or five bunches of flowers that all you have to sell to make up for that. So that's Ellen's course, Preparing to Sell to Floor. She'll find it over at the gardenersworkshop.com. I'm sure Kelly, I mean, um, Jesse is going to post a link here. Um, but Kathy, that'll change your life. Ellen is a florist that buys only local flowers. So it is totally what the course that just will tell you everything that you need to know. Nancy, want to have an autumn only farm for flowers, grasses, pods, gourds. What a great idea. What would be your favorite to grow for this market? Thank you for all you do. Well, Nancy, um, I haven't thought about that, but the majority, one of the things that we talk about in flower farming school is that the, one of the biggest boats that I see people miss is that some of the greatest warm season tender annuals should be succession planted. And they should be succession planted the last one of the year, but in fall color mixes so that it's fall colors, right? Um, and then adding in like what you're talking about, you know, all those great fall things um, that are going on in the fall. You know, I mean, there's cosmos and coxcomb and zinnias, of course, and tons of grasses and pods and um Oh, I hadn't even thought about, but there's just a lot of stuff. And it's all about succession planting and thinking fall colors. And that's basically the opposite of what Jonathan and Megan do, Springforth Farm. They wanted to have summer free because they're homesteaders. They put up a lot of food. They hunt and put up meat. Um, and they want their family. They have their young growing family. They want to go on vacations. Um, so they plant a ton of cool flowers in the fall, plus a bunch of bulbs. Um, and they have a couple of hoop houses um, and a greenhouse. And that's what they do. They only sell from like February till May 31st. I mean, what a dream. And they make a lot of money. And then they don't, I mean, then they're free for the rest of the year. And it just, that is just such a great model. I need to do another podcast with him. Um, so they, you're so welcome, Nancy. And so that's what I would be thinking. I mean, grasses and pods and just fall colors of all those um, warm season tender annuals. Andy, when I water the freshly sown sunflowers, so many of them flop to the top. Perhaps I need to push them down further. So Andy, that is, first off, sunflowers are very quick to flop. 
if they are not getting 16 hours of light and bright light, they really are quick to do that. That's one of the reasons that I leave them inside under the grow lights as long as I can till I get them outside. That's So let's just say I took them off the heat and popped them right outside. The days still aren't 16 hours of light. I mean, we're, we're getting there, but it's not quite there yet, but it's still cool outside. So that slows the growth down, but yet the light's not bright. That really makes them get rangy. So if you can, my suggestion would be to leave them under grow lights, which just means brighter, longer light, um, and that'll keep them from getting floppy. I have some outside, um, so I'm really careful. I try to not, not lay them down, and if I do lay them down, make them lay one way so they can come back up and not be so tangly. That was a great question. So Roebuck Mountain Hill um, asks Mountain Farm, how do you rotate your crops every year? So my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, really talks about this because I'm all by the virtue of the way that I succession plant that rotates my crops. I have no big plan except my succession plan. And I, that's one of the main subject matters, the underlying kind of subject in Vegetables Love Flowers. It actually has diagrams in the back that shows beds going through um, a season, a year of seasons. Um, and my new book will do that too, by the way, y'all. Um, and because it's the hardest thing for people to understand. We make it so dadgum complicated. So I basically plant in blocks of beds. I break up my garden either, let's just say for easy for thinking, three blocks. So if I had an acre, I'd have, um, or let's just say I had um, 30 beds, 100 feet long. I would have 10 bed in, e in beds in each block. One block would be my cool flowers. They get planted with fall stuff and very early spring, 10 beds all together. Makes it so much easier when you just keep them together. The next block of 10 beds is my first very early, my first spring planting, the first warm season stuff, right? And that one would also include my first successions of sunflowers. This third set of 10 beds is my second succession of warm season stuff. And by the time I get, so this is planted, you know, right after my frost date, then this is planted about four to six weeks later. Then by the time I want to plant my third succession and even more sunflowers, right, they're constantly being planted. The cool flowers are pretty much done and we have started pulling them out and we start plugging them in. And by virtue of that, really the whole system is based on where my cool flowers are. I'm already, I already know where my cool flowers are going to go this fall because that dictates how, where I plant things all this year. And by virtue of moving cool flowers throughout my farm, that kind of keeps me into rotation as well as, because we do like, like to do a lot of leaf mulching for my cool flowers, that adds leaf matter to all my different spaces of my garden on a succession plan. So cool, cool flowers um, kind of dictates that and vegetables love flowers, that book, really kind of explains more um, of how I do that. And this will be my last question. It's getting time here, y'all. So Brittany asks, how do you, what do you use for mulch on beds that you don't use Bio 360? First off, I want to say this is a great question. I just did some whole weeding this morning. Um, so two years ago, three years ago, we started experimenting with no-till. Um, and so I have a no-till area on my farm, but I have been a conventional method farmer for all these years, meaning not pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, but I tilled. Um, and I have a tractor. Now, at first 10 years, I had no tractor. Um, took me a couple more years to get a tractor with a tiller and a bed maker on it. Um, changed my life and quadrupled our gross. Um, but anyway, um, that no-till area on our farm has really given us opportunity to really experiment with different mulches. And Bobo and I have both come to the conclusion that hands down, what is our number one mulch to use all the time, no matter what we're doing, except for direct seeding, is Bio 360. And let me tell you what we've been experiencing. So I've used everything. I've used um, shredded bark shredded leaves, straw, um, any organic matter that's, you know, that we can get our hands on, right? 
to get the weed suppression that Bio360 gives because it covers the entire bed and then you just poke a little hole with your finger or a screwdriver um, to plant your transplant, right? And that means the rest of the bed is not getting sunlight. So those annual weeds are not sprouting. To achieve that same type of weed control with organic mulch, it has to be fairly deep. Um, and so Jenny Love and I, I was on the no-till flowers um, and Jenny, it was very, with, I forget what, I don't know if she numbers her sessions, um, but it talks about seed starting. And she said on there that the biggest misconception about no-till, which she fell victim to, which I fell victim to, is that people like to say, oh, your weeds are so much less. Well, friends, it takes like five years or more to get to that level. You have got some massive seed weed suppression, weed removing to do to get there. And um, so it is very labor intensive. I could have never achieved the volume of flowers. I mean, we produced here from my small farm. My whole property is two and three quarter acres. My garden was never bigger than an acre and a half. And we produce 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week in season for production. And I could have never done it with no-till. There's just too much labor involved. Um, and I know that, I mean, if I was starting today, starting out small and building slowly, that might be a reality. But that's not, I mean, haven't, and I also listened um, to the soil gal, Ellen, and I'm sorry, I don't remember her last name. Um, she's a big vegetable farmer. And she said, you cannot do volume and do no-till. I mean, when I talk volume, I mean volume, like we did, because we wanted to create a high gross, right? Um, so circling back to your question, sorry about that rabbit hole. Um, you have to put like shredded bark so deep that it very easily overcomes newly planted transplants. That's what we experienced. We had a high rate of transplant loss because they get dried out or, I mean, there's a lot of potential pests in the mulch or any leaf matter, right? I mean, people talk about slugs and stuff. When we were using Bio 360, people say, well, gosh, don't you have slugs underneath there? We never lose transplants typically. I mean, very rarely, if ever. But when we started using organic mulches, it was like I felt like a new gardener all over again. We were losing plants. Um, so what we use primarily, so we're in year three now. So our weeds aren't quite as bad. Our pathways are a blooming mess. Still, we still have not mastered that. Um, so the tops of our beds is what we focus on right now, trying to keep them weeded so there aren't new weed seeds falling. And we try to get them when they're young. Um, doesn't always happen. Um, but we've been using shredded bark. Um, straw has to be really deep and you can't find straw that's organic. And the risk of buying non-organic straw is that it's got a systemic herbicide in it that will kill your whole garden, which is a reality. And if you want to learn more about that, um, our good friend, Joe Lample of Growing a Greener World on PBS, on his website, Growing a Greener, Growing a Greener World .com, his blog, just search, um, probably manure. And he brought it in in manure, um, which is cows that had eaten straw that had systemic herbicide sprayed on it. And it was still in their manure and it contaminated his entire garden. Anyway, so we don't use straw. Um, shredded leaves would be a great one, but who's going to, who's got time to shred leaves? Can't use whole leaves. They, they'll mat and take young seedlings out. So to answer your question, if I had to use something, it would be fine shredded bark. But Bio360 is our number one choice. Um, and now that we went through last year because of the book and I was so overwhelmed, we didn't get beds made with the bed maker. And then it got too wet. We couldn't make them. So we had to make them by hand. So we said, oh, we'll just use, you know, mulch isn't so bad. Oh, my gosh. Bobo and I are looking at each other and just shaking our head. Um, I am 100% a Bio360. If you don't know what that is, you can find it on our website. We sell it um, in 50-foot pieces. Um, and so it is biodegradable to corn byproduct, and it's totally and completely awesome. Um, so if I can't use that, then we use shredded bark. So I'm going to answer this since Tom, since Jesse put it over here, I'll answer it. 
Tom asks, I know that you like 30 inch wide beds. I'll tell you more about why I love them. I'm loving them even more after netting today, but how much space do you recommend between to pick the flowers? I'm getting my beds ready. How much space between the beds, I guess is what you're asking. Totally depends on what you're doing, Tom. If you are got a bottom line and you're a farmer trying to make it, I will just say this. There is no money growing in the pathways. Um, Mimo it. Davis and I are kind of famous for saying that. I mean, it's like if you are a commercial farm, wide pathways are lost revenue as well as when they're wide, then they grow more stuff, which requires more labor to maintain them. So when I was in high production, I had 18 to 24 inch wide pathways. We don't carry buckets down pathways. We walk out to um, where the trailers are. Not only does that give our backs a break, but it's just more efficient for us. Um, and so 18 to 24 inches for a commercial. Um, but my bed maker makes us have them 24 to 30 inches. Um, but if you're having a garden where it's a pleasure garden, I would make them 36 inches and plan on maintaining them with mowing them or whatever you actually um, do. And I'll tell you another reason I love 30 inch wide beds. This morning, um, it became really obvious as I was netting with some old, we use netting from year to year, y'all. Um, if you use netting properly, cut properly, and then remove it as soon as you're supposed to, it is not a tangled mess. So you can reuse it. I was reusing some really old netting that had been rolled up and stored properly. And um, it all had four hall, had too many holes and I had to cut the edges off of all of them. I went to narrower beds even before I got my tractor because the back breaking job of harvesting is the number one job on our farm. That's what takes the most time. And when you have to reach further and deeper into a bed to get down to where you're supposed to make the cut, that is what really takes your back out. Having narrower beds really cuts how much you're reaching. Oh my gosh, I saw somebody the other day in a hoop house. I'm telling you, their bed was probably five feet wide. They were young. And I thought, oh my gosh, you want to. And see, those are the kind of things that people do that make them not flower farm for very long because it kills them to harvest. So the narrow their beds, um, it's easier on harvesting. And so when I net a 30 inch wide bed, that's typically five, that would be five squares of netting because a square is six inches, but I only use four squares because that's another little tweak of harvesting is I don't want to have to be reaching in and having netting in my way. I want to be able to reach the center really easy. So I basically use narrower netting than the bed is by just a smidgen. And yeah, there's a few stems on the edges that you might lose, but maybe not. And it makes the job just so much easier. Um, and it just, anyway, gone down a rabbit hole. So pathways, 18 to 24, if you're commercial grower, pleasure up to 36 inches. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me. And Jesse has some announcements I need to make. So I am doing the Q&A next week um, on Ask a Flower Farmer at 1230 Eastern time on Instagram. You know, we have all some of my different flower farming friends come in and take a session for us. And they will, um, I will be on that seat on Wednesday. So see you 1230. And then next Friday, if you haven't been joining me for the shop and show, this is a great one to join. It's for Mother's Day. Y'all, And first off, let me just show you this before I forget. I got, I got flowers everywhere in here, y'all. I have so much, so many flowers, and it's going to be the same this coming Friday. So we're having a Mother's Day special show inside the shopping app. So get the app and join me at 12 noon on Friday. Um, and the app, you can actually watch it from Facebook, but the experience is so much better and you have so many more features to interact with when you're there. Um, and then remember to join me back here next Saturday morning, right here at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And next week I will be demonstrating um, this mini 75 Swift blocker, which is the commercial version of soil blockers. Um, and friends, remember, pick up those books. I mean, I'm good. I can't, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to dig out my Amy um, Stewart. You know, it's really cool because we both are book authors. She and I are in the same association, the, um, 
garden communicators. And I have met her at conferences and, you know, had a beverage with her. And um, she's a pretty interesting person. She's written some great books. Wicked Flowers is Wicked Plants is another great one she wrote. But Flower Confidential and Vegetables Love Flowers are all about sustainable um, succession planting and getting the big story on what the flower world is all about. All right, friends, until we meet again. Ciao.